Good evening. You guys are uh, real troopers coming out here in this hot weather today. Thank you for being here. I appreciate that. Of course, it's pretty nice in here, isn't it? You remember how nice it is when you walk back out the door. <laughs> yeah, it's like sitting under a, one of them hair dryers at a beauty salon or something, you know? They still use those big old things and put them over women's head? They still have those? No? Probably not. It's blow dryer days these days. So how y'all doing? Yeah, you're all kind of quiet tonight. You're church mice tonight. Anyway, good to be with you. Can you imagine living in Phoenix? It's been like 110 for over a month. Whew. Man, I don't know how they do it. I did it for 13 years, but that was enough. That was enough. Yeah. That was enough. I never did get used to it, so. Whew. And humid, right? Yeah. Well, we are truly blessed up here in the Northwest. All right. You guys want to read some scripture here tonight? Huh? Yeah, we should pray first. Who said that? <laughs> I know who said that. Yes, let's do. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you tonight, Lord, for this opportunity to come together here tonight and to study your word together just go over these scriptures and thank you so much, Lord, for the, for the record that we have here to learn about the history uh, of the Jewish people. And uh, thank you so much, Lord, for this place that we have that we can come into where it's nice and cool and a good place to, to fellowship. And thank you for that. That's a real blessing for us. And so, God, I just want to ask you as we do... Read down through these scriptures, Lord, that uh, Holy Spirit, you would uh, speak to our hearts and, and uh, once again, Lord, open our eyes to some of your truths. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're going to be in 2 Kings chapter 3, is where we're going to get started tonight. If you want to turn there in your Bibles. Youth group has their big camp out this weekend, so if you think about it, be praying for them and and uh, that everything goes nice and smooth up there should be a good time for them. I hear it's going to cool off a little bit before, yeah, down into the 80s. That's more like it. So anyway, let's go ahead and we'll just start reading down through here. If you will follow along with me, that would be great. We're going to continue to uh, look at the story of Elisha and some of these kings of Judah and Israel. And so verse 1 of chapter 3 says that Jehoram, the son of Ahab, became king over Israel at Samaria in the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah. And he reigned for 12 years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, but not like his father and mother. For he put away the sacred pillar of Baal that his father had made. Nevertheless... He persisted in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who had made Israel sin. He did not depart from them. Now, Mesha, the king of Moab, was a sheep breeder, and he regularly paid the king of Israel 100,000 lambs and the wool of 100,000 rams. And it happened when Ahab died that the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. So King Jeho Jehoram went out of Samaria at that time and mustered all of Israel. And he went and he sent to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, saying that the king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you go with me to fight against Moab? He said, I will go up. I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. 
So we've got this king that was paying tribute, king of Moab, and uh, I guess he decides here that he doesn't want to really continue to pay this outrageous tribute to these uh, to the king any longer, and so he rebels against him. Now, interesting, um, these two kings are actually related to each other through through Ahab. Um, Maybe we could point out here before we go too far that this king, um, Jehoram, it tells us that he did evil in the sight of the Lord, but not like his father and mother. So what do you, what do you think about the idea that you can eliminate some evil, but not all. You can cleanse some of the things out of the nation, but other things we're going to go ahead and tolerate. And it kind of looks like that's what this king was doing. He wasn't as bad as his father, but he still persisted uh, in allowing the people to worship uh, gods other than Jehovah. And you, you know what we've seen over and over and over again, that when you compromise like that in your life, in your individual life, uh, with your family or a nation, a group of people, uh, and you turn away from the Lord... You know, God had said something to the people about turning away from God, and, and he said, you know, if you turn away from me, then there's going to be wild beasts. They're going to come in, and they're going to attack your children, and things aren't going to be very nice there because you have compromised. And how much uh, do we learn from these guys about the idea of going halfway can you imagine if Jesus only went halfway? We'd all be still in our sin, wouldn't we? And when you read the account of him in the garden, it's interesting because that final evening when he was in the garden there, um, it tells us that he left the disciples, Peter, James, and John, to pray. And then it tells us that he went a little further. And I always remember that little sentence right there that <clears throat> Jesus went a little further. He went all the way. He didn't stop short. He accomplished his mission. And thankfully for us, he did. But when we get into the Old Testament records, we see over and over again where they go a little ways. Excuse me. I'm yawning. They go a little ways but they don't go all the way. They don't sell out completely to God. Now, could that be something that we would, uh, I don't know, see in the church today in people's lives where they do not choose to go all the way? They're willing to go part of the way, but when you're serving Jesus Christ, you have to go all the way. It has to be abandonment of our old lives, our self-centered life, to follow Jesus. And I think maybe that as we look around today at the church at large, maybe we see that part of the problem with the church today is compromise, an unwillingness to stand firm in the things of God and not allow... Um, things to creep in to the church that we know from Scripture that God does not approve of. And so the nation of Israel and Judah still going down this road of melancholy, lukewarm, uh, not sold out to God. They need something terrible to happen in order for them to be broken again and repent. 
um, I think kind of like the same thing that happens in our lives. Sometimes we get a little bit stiff, get a little bit cold-hearted, and the Lord intervenes in our life, and, and uh, we find ourselves being broken again. And he reminds us, we have to go all the way. Jesus went all the way, and he wants us to do the same. So these two kings are frustrated with the king of Moab. He's their source of wool. The numbers are astounding, how many sheep and goats that he had to uh, come up with for these two kings. So he does ask him, will you go with me in verse 7 and fight against Moab? And he said, yeah, I'll go with you because we're related. Your people are my people. My people are your people. You know, my horses are your horses. And so he asked the question, which way shall we go up? By the way of the wilderness of Edom. And so the king of Israel went with the king of Judah and the king of Edom. And they marched on that roundabout route for seven days. And there was no water for the army, nor for the animals that followed. <laughs> and the king of Israel said, Alas, for the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. So, these guys make this plan. They haven't really considered praying about it. They're just jumping out in there, deciding to go and march on this. And evidently, they're marching in circles for seven days, and there's no water. They can't take care of their animals. And what do they do? They find themselves in a bad predicament, a tight spot, if you will. And the first thing they do is they begin to try to blame God. Now, I'll bet if they would have prayed about it in the first place, things would have probably would have a little bit different for them, but they did not. And so now they're thinking, oh boy, you know what, here we are. God's pulled us all together here so that we could all be destroyed by the king of Moab. And so Jehoshaphat, who, by the way, was a pretty godly king, not like Joash, but he was pretty, uh, he brought some revival in, into the nation. So Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat asks, is there no prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of the Lord by him? Every time I read that, we see that over and over in the scripture, and I keep thinking to myself, I'm so glad that we don't have to rely on anybody to go to them, to ask them to go to God on our behalf. Aren't you glad? We go right to the source. We go right to Jesus. We don't have to go to a man you don't have to go to your pastor. You don't have to go to the, the, the pope. You don't have to go to any man in order to have an audience with Jesus. And I love that about our faith, that we have access to him all the time. These people have this mindset that if you want to hear from God, you've got to have a prophet. You've got to have somebody that can tell you what God wants you to do or doesn't want you to do. And so one of the servants of the king of Israel answered, and he said, Elisha, the son of Saphat, is here. Saphat, or however you would say that. He's the one who poured water on the hands of Elijah. In other words, he was Elijah's servant. And Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. And then Elisha, verse 13, says to the king of Israel, What have I to do with you? Go to the prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother. But the king of Israel said to him, No, for the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. And Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand... Surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look at you or see you. In other words, if you did not bring Jehoshaphat with you, I don't want really anything to do with you, but because of him, 
I will listen. I will stand here and listen to you. So now bring me, verse 15, a musician. And then it happened when the musician played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. And he said, thus saith the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. For thus saith the Lord, you shall not see wind, nor shall you see rain. Yet that valley shall be filled with water, so that you and your cattle and your animals may drink. And this is a simple matter in the sight of the Lord. He will also deliver the Moabites into your hand. Also you shall attack every fortified city and every choice city. You shall cut down every good tree and stop up every spring of water and ruin every good piece of land with stones. That's pretty rough, isn't it? That's a rough way to deal with your enemies there. You pollute the land, you pollute the water. But this is kind of an interesting little prophecy. Um, that, uh, and it's interesting to me that it was the musician that's playing this music and then the Spirit of the Lord starts speaking to fill the valley with ditches. Little rows of, you know, like almost like irrigation uh, ditches. And there's no rain, there's no wind, but yet, because I'm God, I'm going to fill all these ditches up with water so that your animals can drink, so that you can drink, so that you can be strong. And you're going to go into battle and you're going to have victory. So it happened in the morning in verse 20, when the grain offering was offered, that suddenly water came by way of Edom, and the land was filled with water. And when all the Moabites heard that the kings had come up to fight against them, all who were able to bear arms and older were gathered, and they stood at the border. And then they rose up early in the morning, and the sun was shining on the water. And the Moabites saw the water on the other side as red as blood. And they said, this is blood. Surely the kings have struck swords and have killed one another. Now, therefore, Moab, to the spoil. So they think that there's been this great (coughs) battle among these uh, two kings, that they've destroyed one another, and they're seeing this water as the sun's coming up, probably a reflection of the sunrise on the water, made it look maybe red or orange or whatever. But in their mind, they thought, oh my gosh, they've taken each other out. Let's just go and get the goodies. So when they came to the camp in verse 20, Israel rose up and they attacked the Moabites so that they fled before them and they entered their land killing the Moabites. And then they destroyed the cities, and each man threw a stone on every good piece of land and filled it. And they stopped up all the springs of water, and they cut down all the good trees. But they left the stone of Ker Hereseth intact. However, the slingers surrounded and attacked it. The slingers with the slingshots or whatever like David had. And when the king of Moab saw that the battle was too fierce for him, he took with him 700 men who drew swords to break through to the king of Edom, but they could not. And then he took his eldest son, who would have reigned in his place, and offered him as a burnt offering upon the wall. And there was great indignation against Israel. So they departed from him and they returned to their own land. What an act of desperation, huh? That you would sacrifice your son. Who would have been king, but he offers him up as a sacrifice. Man, that's really, really 
horrible to think about that a person would become that desperate. But we see that what the prophecy told us earlier in the chapter, it gets fulfilled completely. And they basically ruined the land. There was no way to get water. It's a tough way to fight against your enemy. It's ruthless. Causes a lot of suffering. Slow death. So they all go back to their own land. And it tells us in chapter 4, verse 1, there was a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets who cried out to Elijah, Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. So you're in debt. You can't pay your bills. Your husband has passed away. You have some strong boys, and the ones that you owe money to are going to come and take your kids and make them slaves in order that your debt might be paid. Another pretty ruthless policy, right, that they could come and do that. And so Elisha says to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. And then he said, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels, and do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you will shut the door behind you and your sons, and then pour it into all of those vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went from him, and she shut the door behind her and her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured it out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said to her son, Bring me another vessel. And he said to her, There is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. And then she came and she told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil to pay your debt, and you and your sons live on the rest. Pretty amazing. Much like what Elijah did with the widow in providing for her needs also. We see this miracle of the oil. Now, when we look at oil in the Old Testament, it's always a picture of the Holy Spirit. That anointing oil that, you know, tells us that they poured on the king's head to anoint him as king. And I like this because go borrow vessels. You know, you and I, we're vessels. We're containers. Question is, what's in my container? What am I carrying around with me? Am I carrying around the Holy Spirit? Am I carrying around something else? Or maybe I'm just an empty vessel. He said, go borrow these from everywhere. Get as many as you possibly can. Don't gather just a few. And I look at that and I think to myself, you know, that's kind of what the Lord is speaking to us. Don't get just a little bit of oil. Get it all. Get all of it that you can possibly get. Because we need the Holy Spirit in our lives desperately. We want as much of Him as we can possibly get. And so this woman, it's very cool how she was obedient. Now, you know, you and I maybe would think, really? How's that going to work out? I'm going to go get all these empty vessels, 
And this little thing of oil I got, she's going to keep coming out and coming out. That doesn't make any sense at all. I can see there, there's only so much in there, and I'm pouring this out. And, but she was obedient, and she did not question the Lord. She went and did exactly what he asked her to do. She was obedient, even though perhaps it seemed kind of silly, maybe even a little childish. But yet, look what happens. They fill up every container. You know, that's so cool because, like I said a minute ago, God wants to fill up every container, every vessel, every one of us, all of his kids. He wants us all to be filled with the Holy Spirit. God provided for her in kind of a unique way. She was able to sell the oil and then live on the money she made plus pay her debt. God provided for her needs. God was faithful. Now it happened one day in verse 8 that Elisha went to Shunem where there was a notable woman and she persuaded him to eat some food. And so it was, as often as he passed by, he would turn in there and eat some food. So she says to her husband, Look now, I know that this is a holy man of God who passes by us regularly. Please let us make a small upper room on the wall. Let us put a bed for him there and a table, and a chair, and a lampstand. And so it will be whenever he comes to us that he can turn in there. So not only do we want to feed him, but we're going to put him up for the night also. We're going to build a little room for him on the wall where he can come and rest. I like that. So it happened one day that he came there, and he turned into the upper room, and he lay down there. And then he said to Gehazi, his servant, call this Shumanite woman. And when he had called her, she stood before him. And he said, and said to him, say now to her, look, you have been concerned for us with all of this care. So what can I do for you? Do you want me to speak on your behalf to the king? Or to the commander of the army? And she answered, I dwell among my own people. And so he said, Well, what then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, Actually, she has no son, and her husband is old. They have no, no boys, no one to carry on the family. So he said, call her, and when he had called her, she stood in the doorway, and he said, about this time next year, you will embrace a son. Sounds kind of familiar, huh? You know how many stories there are in the Bible about barrenness and how God steps in and brings a child to barren women? We see that over and over and over again. Only God could do that. I mean, you can start in the New Testament, and you start working backwards, you see it happening. You know, John the Baptist is a good example of that. Um, it, well, it's a, there's many, many examples that we could point to, but here's just another amazing little story that really is often kind of uh, not read very much. It's not spoken of very much, this particular story right here. But she says, No, my Lord, man of God, do not lie to your maidservant. Do not get my hopes up. Evidently, she had been wanting a child all of her life, was unable to have one. But now, in verse 17, she conceives, and she bears a son. And when the appointed time had come, of which Elijah had told her. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing blessing from God to this woman. 
And why this woman? Why the blessing? Well, I think it was because of her faithfulness. I think it was because of her servant's heart to care for and to feed and, and to house this prophet. She honored him by doing that, and by honoring him, she's honoring God. And now God's blessing her with this miraculous uh, event of having a child. And verse 18 tells us that the child grew, and it happened one day that he went out to his father to the reapers. And he said to his father, my head, my head. And so he said to his servant, carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees until noon, and then he died. And she went up and she laid him on the bed of the man of God. And she shut the door upon him and went out. Pretty interesting. After all these years, she finally has a child. Evidently, he's still fairly young. Small enough to be carried by the servant. And small enough to sit on her knees. And he dies. Interesting that he complains about his head. Maybe he had a stroke. We don't know. But he has died, and now all of her hopes of having this child perhaps have vanished. And she called her husband in verse 22 and said, Please send me one of the young men and one of the donkeys that I may run to the man of God and come back. I love that. She's lost her child, but she's not given up on God. And so he said, why are you going to him today? It's neither a new moon or the Sabbath. And she said, it is well. And then she saddled the donkey and said to her servant, drive and go forward and do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. So she departed, and she went to the man of God at Mount Carmel. And so it was when the man of God saw her afar off that he said to his servant Gehazi, Look, the Shubanite woman, Please run now to meet her and say to her, Is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with your child? And she answers, It is well. Now when she came to the God, man of God on the hill, she caught him by the feet, but Gehazi came nearer and pushed her away. And the man of God said, Let her alone, for her soul is in deep distress. And the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. And so she said, did I ask a son of my Lord? Did I not say, do not deceive me? And then he said to Gehazi, get yourself ready and take my staff in your hand and be on your way. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. If anyone greets you, do not answer him. But lay my staff on the face of the child. As the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So he arose, and he followed her. Interesting. It's interesting to me that he sends the, the servant, Gehazi, in verse 31, goes ahead of them. And he takes Elisha's staff, and he lays it on the face of the child. But there was neither voice nor hearing. Nothing happened. Therefore he went back to meet him and he told him, saying, The child is not awakened. So when Elisha came into the house, there was the child lying dead on his bed. He went in, therefore, and he shut the door behind the two of them, and he prayed to the Lord. 
And he went up and laid on the child. He put his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, his hands on his hands, and he stretched himself out on the child. And the flesh of the child became warm. He returned and he walked back and forth in the house. And again he went up and stretched himself out on him. And then the child sneezed seven times. And the child opened his eyes. And he called Gehazi and he said, Call the Shumanite woman. So he called her, and when she came to him, he said, Pick up your son. And so she went in, and she fell at his feet, and she bowed to the ground, and she picked up her son and went out. Don't ask me why it worked out this way, because it's very strange. He puts his mouth on his mouth and his eyes on his eyes and he basically lays on top of this child, warms his body. It's a true miracle, absolutely a miracle, but the method in which it was accomplished is very strange. I mean, think about it, you know, we... (laughs) I think we have expectations on how God's going to do things sometimes. But this is so abnormal. It's so off the wall. Um, You have to give Elisha credit uh, in a sense because he didn't give up on the boy. You know, at first the boy didn't respond, but he went back up there again. There's got to be some sort of a numerical message here in that the child sneezed seven times. Seven times a number of completion, a complete and total healing, not partial, but completely healed. And also in verse 33, it's interesting that he put everybody out. You know, Jesus did the same thing when he raised that little girl from the dead. All the people were in there wailing and crying and mourning, and he put them all out. And when he said that she was sleeping, they all made fun of him, and they ridiculed him, and they didn't believe that unbelief had to be removed. And so he puts them all out. And he only takes Peter, James, and John there with him and accomplishes this miracle. He didn't have to lay on the child. He just called her back. And she came back. But this is kind of interesting to me how this particular miracle takes place. Definitely different than your garden variety healing right? Could you imagine, you know, calling somebody up to come over and pray for your sick child and they lay down on top of the kid and suddenly the kid is healed and he comes back and you're like, wow, that was a very strange method, but thank God it worked. So she picks up her son and she goes out. You notice at first when she, in verse 28, she, um, she's kind of wavering. She's kind of losing her faith here a little bit. She's, she's kind of complaining to the prophet saying, why are you messing with my head? I told you, even before I had this child, don't mess with me. Don't lie to me. Don't get my hopes up. And then I have a child And now the child has died. She starts to waver in her faith, but, you know, that did not really stop the prophet from going and healing this child for her. I have to think that perhaps all that time that they were taking care of him, feeding him, housing him, 
that they had to have developed a relationship. And because of all the great things that they did on, for him to take care of him, he didn't give up on them either. It's interesting when you actually sit down and you start counting all the miracles that we see in Scripture. And I might have mentioned this earlier in our study that uh, Elisha has many more recorded miracles than Elijah did. Little miracles like this. Little miracles like the oil to, to take care of the, the person. So, you know, what's the moral of the story, so to speak, right? I love the proverb that says, trust the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. That means when things seem absolutely, totally off the rails, dark, hopeless, trust in the Lord with all your heart. I'm always wanting to figure it out. As a matter of fact, I'm trying to figure this one out. How is it that he did it this way? Very strange way to go about this miracle. And in my own understanding, I would say, that's very confusing. But I really have to fall back on that. What does it mean to trust the Lord with all of your heart? It means, it means sometimes I can't look at the circumstances and try to come up with a deduction of, based on my circumstances. God's bigger than my circumstances. He can change my circumstances, but what if he chooses not to? Speak. <laughs> what if he chooses not to change our circumstances? What do we do then? Do we keep trusting? Do we keep praying? Or do we sit there and try to figure out, okay, what went wrong? What did I do wrong? Maybe I didn't pray long enough. Maybe I should have fasted. Maybe I shouldn't have watched that program on TV. We start trying to analyze things. We start trying to figure it out. We start trying to say, okay, you know, God is saying, this is beyond you. This is beyond your ability to reason. So trust me with all your heart. Don't try to figure me out because I'm always going to fool you if you try to figure me out. But if you're faithful, I'll take care of you. If you're faithful, I'll provide for your needs. If you're faithful, I'll heal your life. But Lord, I still have the circumstance, though. I still have this issue. I still have this illness. I still have this financial problem. You didn't fix it for me. I once heard a pastor say that God may not always change our circumstances. But he, may, he will always change us in the midst of our circumstances. So even though we may suffer, even though we may go through hardship, maybe heartbreak, whatever it might be, God wants us to know, I am still here. I am still in control. You are still my child. So trust in me beyond your mental capacity to try to figure this out. And I'll direct your path. And so Elisha, he returns to Gilgal, and there was a famine in the land. And the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, and he said to his servant, put on the large pot and boil stew for the sons of the prophets. So one went into the field to gather herbs and found the wild vine and gathered it from a lap full of wild gourds and came and sliced them into the pot of stew, though they did not know what they were. 
So he's out trying to find herbs. He's going to cook up these herbs. And he finds this vine that he's not too sure what it is, but we're going to cook it up. <laughs> we're hungry. So they get it and they slice it all up. And by God, they find out that it's not good to eat. And they served it to the men. And it happened as they were eating the stew that they cried out. And they said, man of God, there's death in the pot. And they could not eat it. And so he said, now here's another really strange one. And so he says, bring me some flour. And he put flour into the pot and he said, serve it to the people that they may eat. And there was nothing harmful in the pot. How do you figure that out? What, what, I mean, all of these miracles that we're seeing, one after the other, and you're like, my goodness, you know, God can do anything, any way that he chooses to do it, no matter how ridiculous sometimes it might seem. There's a man of God in verse 42 that comes from Baal, Shalisha, and he brought the man of God bread of the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley bread, and newly ripened grain in his knapsack. He said, give it to the people that they may eat. But his servant said, what? Shall I set this before 100 men? And he said again, give it to the people that they may eat. For thus saith the Lord, they shall eat and have some left over. And so he set it before them, and they ate, and they had some left over according to the word of the Lord. So chapter 4 ends with this final miracle. Does it remind you of anything? They only had one little bit of food, but yet it feeds all of these people. And of course, they're looking at it going, we just have a little bit. It reminds me of the of the disciples going, Lord, all we have is a couple of loaves of bread and a couple of fish. And you got thousands of people out there. And what happens? Jesus feeds them all, and they were full. And when they took up the leftovers, there were more of the leftovers left than there was in the original uh, amount of food. So here we see the Lord doing much of the same thing to... Uh, make the food multiply. And of course, you know, if I was sitting there, I would probably feel the same way. You got a hundred men sitting here, man. You're going to, you got one little pot of porridge, right? How's that going to work? Don't question the Lord. Just be obedient. Give it to the people. Don't question it. Thus saith the Lord, they will eat and have some left over. So God doesn't just always just barely get us through. He gets us through with a bounty. He gets us through with more than enough. Whether it's food, comfort, wisdom, whatever we might need, God is able to multiply it. God is able to take something that is totally broken and turn it into something very useful. He can do that with human beings. It's amazing to me that he can do that. It's amazing to me that even some of us in here tonight, we can look at our life and go, yeah, I'm a miracle. What God did in my life is a miracle. You know, you could probably say, should I even be walking the earth still? If it wasn't for the Lord, I probably wouldn't be. But he has a plan. He has a plan for each one of our lives. And it's really important that, well, as we see these crazy miracles being done, the point is, no matter how outrageous, no matter how unfathomable the problem is, God's bigger. God's able. God's willing and ready 
to go a little further for us. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for that truth. Every one of these uh, little miracles we see here, Lord, you went above and beyond. And you did it in a way that people can walk away only knowing that it was you that did it. Their false gods, their Baals, and their statues, and their totems, and those things could never, ever come close to you, Lord. And you prove over and over to them, and you prove over and over to us your mighty power and your mighty love towards us. But Lord, help us that we would not be like some of these people who would forget you so soon, who would turn back to their old ways. Help us, Lord, to walk with you every day, to trust you in all of our circumstances, Lord, to mold us and to shape us and to make us into the people that you've called us to be. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us life. And as we go out of here tonight, Lord, please build our faith. Make us strong so that we can deal with the issues of our lives, too, in this time that we're living in. And we thank you for your provision in our lives. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.